Stanford University.
Good afternoon. Welcome to 380. Today we're going to look again at memory architecture, um, specifically the memory hi hierarchy, which for a long time has been strangely persistent. Static memory, dynamic memory, disk, and occasionally tape. Those, the advantage of being old, one advantage of being old is you remember things that have been tried before. And there's a huge gap, as we all know, between dynamic memory and disk, a huge target, and lots of people have tried to fill it. Um, I remember bubble memory, CCD, and a strange thing called obonics. How about uh, memories? <laughs> How about core memories? <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there are many others, but I started tuning them out after I saw the way the other ones um, sort of cratered. We're finally, perhaps, going to have something in the middle. And isn't that nice? Um, on the other hand, dynamic memory has gotten to this stage where we can now afford so much that some of us don't use even disk anymore. So today's speaker, Alfazio, is going to tell us about Intel's efforts in this area. Since they don't make disk, how are they going to take over the whole computer? <laughs> <laughs> It'll all be out of sync with chip. So uh, before I get started along this theme of, uh, this has been tried before. About two months ago, I was getting lunch at the Intel cafeteria. And it was kind of a, one of these crowded days, not a lot of places to sit, didn't see anyone I knew. So I start making my way for this open uh, table. And there's a, you know, a, a bright, starry eyed guy, young guy, uh, also making his way for the same table. And so we said, well, let, let's just share this table, sit down and have lunch. And so we start chatting. And um, turns out he was a, a, a recent Stanford grad, uh, I think. Professor Wong student, and uh, it was his second day at Intel. And we start chatting, and he asked me uh, how long I'd been at Intel. And so I, so I told him I joined Intel in 1982. And he looked at me, dropped his fork, and he said, you've been working here longer than I've been alive. <laughs> um, needless to say, it was not a very good lunch after that for either one of us. <laughs> so. I'm going to get your microphone checked here. Go ahead. Is it, is it on now? Nope. <laughs> oh. Is it on now? Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Usually my voice carries well enough. So I'm going to be talking about the uh, future of compute memory and very specifically uh, uh, non-volatile semiconductor uh, memory. And uh, I, my background is as a uh, device physicist and a process guy. Uh, and um, I'm going to try to approach this from a computer architecture perspective. So uh, be kind to me with your questions. So what's the uh, uh, outline of this talk? First, I'm going to go, what are the motivations? Why, why do we want to try to get semiconductor, <coughs> excuse me, non volatile memory in a compute application? Uh, go through the uh, key principles of a uh, NAND flash operations and the key device physics attributes from a compute application's viewpoint. How are you going to deal with this uh, memory? Uh, go over some controller uh, architecture. Uh, what's the memory controller? The impact that NVM can have on a compute architecture and some future trends that, uh, that may exist. So uh, speaking about uh, being old, uh, we started Flash in the mid-80s as uh, it started to evolve kind of from an EEPROM base and an E-squared base, trying to get both of those functionalities in the same chip. And we started about the mid-80s. And uh, it was the idea, and this was uh, actually the for first flash uh, memory technology. Uh, our idea was to put NVM in compute. So I've actually been trying to do this for over two decades. Uh, this is a, uh, a one megabyte uh, IBM PC adding card uh, that we tried to build as an emulation. We actually kind of shopped this around to, uh, not as a product, but as a the concept of what Flash can do. Uh, we actually, uh, in the early days, was bringing this to uh, companies like Kodak and various other places and showing the concept of what non-volatile memory can do as a forerunner to uh, going into things like uh, digital cameras. Uh, this is a 256 kilobit uh, Flash device. Uh, I think there's 32 of them uh, on there. So it's a one megabyte adding card, probably about yay big. 
So uh, what, what has happened in the last two decades? Well, this is the view of it uh, today. Um, this is a solid state um, uh, disk. Uh, this is uh, actually have, this is a 1.8 inch uh, version here. This computer is running on a uh, solid state disk uh, right now. So if it crashes, uh, I'll, I'll be running through the door. Um, this is an 80 gigabyte uh, system. Has uh, uh, each uh, uh, die on there. Is, um, it's a dual die. Uh, stack each uh, component is a 16 gigabyte a uh, gigabit 2 gigabyte um, 50 nanometer uh, multi-level cell device there's actually two versions of this that we uh, introduced one is with a single level cell uh, one is with a multi-level cell targeted to two different applications and I'll go over what those applications are the system that I'm running here has a multi-level cell 80 gigabyte uh, MLC device and it. it's kind of targeted towards more of uh, kind of you and I using a mobile uh, type of device. The single level cell is much higher performance going in, into kind of uh, enterprise-like applications. And these are uh, SATA, SATA 2 interfaces. So uh, uh, three gigabit uh, uh, per second. Actually, there's a full range of non-volatile memory and compute that's really emerging. Uh, uh, what I'm gonna be going over today is just the ones on the top line showing what uh, solid state disk can do in a computer and also the concept of uh, disk caches. Uh, the bottom line is uh, kind of what's really enabling some of these very small, um, uh, people have different terms for it these days, these mobile internet devices, MIDs, netbooks, net tops, I, I get fully confused on them. Uh, different form factors of, uh, of solid state drives. So what's the motivation? Why are, why are we, uh, uh, trying to do this and it's really to solve a basic problem and that basic problem is illustrated on this graph that shows kind of the progress of what's happened uh, on the CPU side and what's happened in the IO subsystem. Uh, the x-axis is going over the last uh, dozen or so years. Uh, the y-axis is showing normalized performance and showing the disparity uh, that is growing between the CPU performance. The question? Yeah, your disk line, is that a single disk or IOPS, say, in a subsystem as measured by a spec mark? Uh, I think it's single disk and not spec mark. That's correct. And if you did spec mark, it would be a much more aggressive line? Uh, not really, because the, uh, uh, the performance is, and I'll show you why, the performance is uh, dominated in a lot of these by uh, what the uh, rotational latency is, not necessarily a throughput uh, for what the system is. Um, also, a lot of the uh, benchmarks that are kind of done on systems are, uh, you know, in, Intel's uh, very uh, strong in, in building benchmarks and working with the <coughs> ecosystem for that. You try to build benchmarks that highlight your capability and so moving aw away from things that highlight all the inadequacies of the IO subsystem. Uh, but you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> um, so you can see the growing uh, disparity and as you get to multi-core processors it gets even worse and the reason for that is because you're having multiple processing that's going on, each making demands of that IO uh, subsystem, and so you have all this traffic that's in there. And so this has been, um, is kind of a, uh, a growing gap, and I actually have another curve that uh, I couldn't find uh, that I wanted to include, which was, when was the last time a gap like this between the processor and the subsystem started to occur, uh, and what was done? It was probably about, uh, uh, you know, uh, around 15 years ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago, which was between the processor and the DRAM, and this is when caches started to get integrated onto the processor. And you have these large gaps growing. So this large gap in here is really what's uh, changing things. And so the goal in this is how do you bridge this gap? And so you see the capability of what the solid state disk were able to do is to meet that performance requirement of the CPU, and what I'll be talking about is how solid state disk and turbo memory is just a marketing term for what a, uh, uh, a solid state cache is in front of the drive, and so how those can basically bridge <coughs> this gap. So what I've been doing for the last 20 years since uh, having this original vision, and uh, it didn't really pan out, uh, so we had to go off and do some stuff. So we built a bunch of technologies, and what this is showing is the progression of uh, flash technology over the last uh, 20 years. It started off with a 1.5 micron 
uh, technology. It was 36 micron squared cell size, if I remember correctly. Uh, now to the uh, latest is a uh, 32 gigabyte, a gigabit device uh, on 34 nanometer, uh, just recently put into production. Multi-level cell uh, came in at about 1987 was the, uh, 1997 was the first commercial product of a multi-level cell in there. And so it's been progressing and it's been going into a lot of different applications. It's in, you know, uh, digital cameras, cell phones, music players. Uh, there's probably not a, uh, a person in this room who doesn't have flash memory somewhere in their consumer electronic devices. And so kind of found its niche in various areas. And now is there an opportunity to come back into uh, what was the original vision, which was how to get into compute. And so, you know, Flash is really a kind of, uh, you know, to the business people, I, I like to tell them, it, it's kind of been this disruptive technology. Um, you know, uh, how many people are photography uh, buffs here? Anyone? Can you find 35 millimeter black and white film anywhere? If you know where to look. You have to, maybe Keeble and Chuck would still have it. Uh, a few it's other color, places. Color process black and white. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's really difficult. It's basically been taken over by uh, by flash memory, uh, floppy disk uh, in there, um, you know, various other things. But if you take a look at kind of where flash has been going in consumer electronics devices, it has sort of characterizations associated with it. Uh, they're large block files. You're putting down a JPEG file, you're putting down an MP3. They tend to be fairly large files that you're putting down in large block access. And I'll go over what the organization of flash is and why that's well suited for that and how that poses a challenge uh, in, uh, in compute applications. And also the number of writes that you do to the device is really determined by some human interaction uh, to the device. How many pictures are you gonna take? Uh, how many downloads of songs are you gonna do off the internet? It, it's, it's a human act and so the number of writes that you do is quite limited. I, I would challenge anyone in this room who has a uh, a flash card for a camera or a USB key, if you've put more than one or two cycles on that a year, uh, you're a real advocate of, you know, an uh, evangelist of using that device. Uh, it's really not uh, used much because of that human interaction. But if we want to get into compute applications, if you really want to disrupt the hard disk drive, then flash has to accommodate the compute characteristics. And what does that mean? It means sm small random writes, so it's not a large block file. You're talking about, you know, 4K sector um, uh, type of uh, uh, writes as a, as a typical number. Uh, you're talking about the number of writes now is really determined by an OS that can be issuing, you know, uh, paging files and all sorts of things at a much faster rate than any of us can be doing by taking pictures or doing downloads. And you kind of add to this, and why do I talk about writes? Well, flash is a non-volatile memory, and what's meant by this cartoon here is really what we go from A to B is just how we're going to move electrons back and forth. That's going to represent the states of the memory of a one and a zero, whether you're in the A or the B state. And I'll go through this in coming slides, but you have to get over an energy barrier. If there was no energy barrier, as soon as you uh, took the power away, the electrons would flow back and it would, it would be a volatile memory. So there's an energy barrier to get over. And every time you do a write to the device, you actually start degrading the device. The reliability is a function of those number of writes. And so now we're going to go in an environment that's very write intensive. We're going to be degrading the device in some fashion. The reliability attributes of it now come into the forefront. Matter of fact, um, um, a few years ago, I was an invited speaker at a, uh, uh, as a, uh, a magnetics conference. Uh, they kind of took the devil and brought them in for an invited talk since uh, I was the threat to uh, that particular uh, market segment. And every question was, you're not an infinite right device. Uh, unlike magnetics, this will never work. And so this is one of the challenges. And so how do we overcome that? So let's go a little bit into how Flash, NAND Flash is organized. Uh, on the left side is just a die photograph uh, of uh, of what a die looks like, and then kind of building out is what the uh, array organization looks like. And so basically a memory block, and a memory block is the unit by which we issue an erase command. So how many 
uh, devices, uh, memory cells uh, can get erased at one time. It's kind of a sea of cells that's uh, arranged in a grid, word lines and, uh, and bit lines that are in there. The top gate of the memory cell, and I'll go through what the cell architecture looks like on the next page, uh, is connected to the word lines. Uh, there are typically 32 cells in a string that would be on here. Uh, I'm only showing five for uh, cartoon purposes. Uh, and the cells of the different word lines are strung together in that series uh, that are in there. Also only shown a few cells that are in that string. And each of these cells are then connected to either a bit line uh, and then the source line. And then there are select devices uh, to be able to select whether you're accessing that particular subsession. Okay, you only read through the string of cells. That's why it's called NAND, because if you look at a circuit equivalent circuit, it would look like a NAND circuit by reading through the string. Okay? So the key thing on here is we're going to select a word line in here, and that's going to be the equivalent of like writing a page. Uh, a typical NAND organization has on one word line will have anywhere from two to uh, from uh, two to four four kilobyte pages uh, that are on there two or four depending upon whether it's uh, MLC or, or a single level cell and then there are typically 32 word lines in there so you have 64 to 128 uh, 4k pages per uh, unit block that's in there so NORs are different in what sense here uh, NORs are different in the sense that um, um, uh, the equivalent circuit is uh, a NOR string, so each cell is directly connected to both the source and the bit line. As a result of that, uh, since you have the direct access, it's faster read access uh, that's in there because it's not pulling down through the resistive string, so uh, it goes into applications that have very fast read access, things like uh, in your cell phone mm -hmm. or, or things like that. Uh, but because of that, there's a lot of disturbs, and it has to have a write mechanism that can uniquely define that individual cell, and so has very low write throughput. And so it's used mostly in read-only applications, uh, as opposed to something that's more balanced in the writes. Okay. So what does a cross-section uh, of the cell look like? Uh, it looks like a MOSFET transistor, uh, except it has this floating gate that's stuck between uh, that's put in there. And the floating gate is uh, electrically isolated, and so there are uh, just oxides surrounding it. And so, uh, and then the charge is, uh, is modulate on the floating gate that you see up over here, whether you have a charge on there, is just going to modulate the threshold. You have an IV that's in there, you have this floating gate. If you have uh, electrons or no electrons on there, it's just going to modulate what the threshold of that device is. So the presence or absence of the electrons on the floating gate is really just going to determine the ones or zeros, and we sense what that current is. The fairly basic concept. So how do we get the charge on and off? This is why I had to show it on my PC, the fancy animation I'm going to have. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we program by injecting electrons uh, to the floating gate. It's going to be fowler nordheim tunneling, fancy uh, animation, so when the electrons being tunneling through, happens a little faster than... Uh, what you're seeing here. Uh, it's just applying a high electric field between the channel and the floating gate. The floating gate is capacitively coupled to the top gate. That high electric field will tunnel electrons from the silicon substrate into the floating gate, um, and then we uh, call that cell programmed. Uh, likewise, if you want to erase, you reverse the polarity, reverse the field. Tunneling is going to occur in the opposite direction from the floating gate into the silicon. Um, it's, um, it's challenged with high K, uh, and the reason for that is uh, we're storing probably on the order of, uh, of uh, a few hundred electrons that are in here uh, on a very small size, and so you're dealing with total amount of charge is uh, a few times 10 to the 12th uh, amount of charge that's going to determine, determine the one or a zero. High K has trap states that are probably close to that density. And so high K tend to be very trappy film that are difficult to use with a non-volatile memory uh, because of the very strict requirement. There's a lot of research going on in that area. So it's uh, kind of the high K that's can use for CMOS logic is, is not quite yet good enough 
uh, for what's needed for the non-volatile memories. But it, it's an area of active uh, work, and probably in the next you know several years, you'll see a lot more of that coming in. Well, since I've done the device physics bit, uh, this seems like a relate. I mean, this is normally what you want to avoid in all some uh, circuits, right? You know, you're, 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 a, you're a good straight man, because I have uh, that, that goes into uh, where we'll be headed. Okay? So that's how we erase the cell. Uh, by having, this is an analog storage, basically. So uh, this is distribution threshold. You have two distributions uh, that's in there, two states. That's one bit per cell. Uh, Multi-level cell is nothing more than uh, essentially controlling an algorithm by how we're placing the uh, uh, the voltages and the number of states in here. If you have multiple states, then you have uh, have two, three bits per cell. It's not quantized at an integer. It's quantized by the number of electron levels uh, that you have. So you can actually have non-integer uh, values. Good straight map. You can see the, uh, the, the the neat graphics that go up on here too. <laughs> the electrons moving around. So th that's exactly um, uh, the point is typically Thaleron tunneling only occurs under accelerated stresses. It's when engineers want to go study what the lifetime is uh, of, a, uh, of a transistor or a high K uh, dielectric. They'll put it under a high field stress to see what the uh, breakdown characteristics are, what the lifetime, the trapping, the interface states. It, it's a characterization tool, almost like the equivalent of a SEM or a TEM. It's the electronic version of doing that. It's a good device physics characterization tool. Um, however, in the case of flash, it's basic to the device operation itself. It's, it's fundamental uh, to how it operates. You, if you didn't have the high field uh, that was in there, you wouldn't store the charge. That's basically shown what happens here on this uh, band diagram on the, uh, on the left side, showing the high field. This is in the case of tunneling the electrons to the floating gate. And basically, over time, you're going to create these trap sites that are in there. And so that's going to change the threshold of the device. Um, as a result of that, you're going to have uh, charge that storage. You can have neutral traps. You can have hold traps. You can have electron traps. You can have interface traps, border traps, bulk traps, all sorts of traps that are in there that then can detrap over time. And so you have shifts in the thresholds and then can also detrap. And those, those detrapping will be perceived as if I have a change in my data condition of the memory cell. And so, you know, I. I just wrote this data into my computer and I come back, I still want that data there, is the threshold still maintained? And so how do we kind of uh, deal with this um, in, in a, um, uh, both in the memory technology and then at the compute system level, how do we go deal with this? So let me talk about bit error rates. And the first thing I want to talk about is, uh, um, you know, typically when you think about uh, bit error rates, you have kind of a raw bit error rate in anywhere from like uh, 1e minus 6, 1e minus 9. So 1 in a million, 1 in a billion cells are going to be an error. And then you can pipe that through an error correcting system to get an outgoing uh, uh, bit error rate. But the raw bit error rate um, is kind of this incoming number. And it can change over time because of the, uh, the use. You can have it immediately after a write because I had write errors. And this is just representing the uh, multi-level cell uh, distributions where I intended to have these nice Gaussian distributions but I created these tails because I have uh, uh, errors in either the algorithm of how I'm going to place the cells or uh, cell issues that cause basically right errors. Those are the things that you see uh, immediately right after you do the write. Those are the easiest from a compute system to deal with because you know that as soon as you wrote the data and you typically have the data still stored before it's committed uh, to, to the memory and can usually deal with those uh, fairly easily. But also what happens after time is those distributions can shift. You can have charge loss and those can be intrinsic distributions uh, where the whole intrinsic uh, population is moving. Or you can have extrinsic tail populations come out because of low level defects in the cell. And those can be either uh, charge loss as you see those uh, ones that are going towards the left. Or you can have charge gain because to read the cell, you have to put a high voltage on for, for read to be able to access the NAND string. And so you can have field accelerations in either direction. These are all a function of, uh, of use condition because, as I said, the more writes you have, you have a high field. And so as you use the device, <coughs> these characteristics are going to change. 
Uh, you have trapping and detrapping, which are thermally activated device, uh, characteristics. So what happens over temperature, what happens over time, what happens over usage. So this kind of uh, adds a little bit of a uh, complication to this because I wanted to have a raw bit error rate. And because, you know, uh, everyone that wants to design an ECC engine wants to know what the raw bit error rate is. And so usually uh, uh, we have this kind of a little bit of a joke that all the system designers want to know the raw bit error rate. And it's a little bit like asking, well, what's the temperature going to be on Tuesday and July 15th, 2009? Well, you have to know what city you're in. You have to know, you know, uh, uh, where it's located. You have to know typically what an average number is. Well, there are worst case that can happen around that. And so really what you have is the complexity that the raw bit error rate is a number, but it's not like pi, right? It's not this fixed value that you can look up. It's a conditional number with a probability distribution around it. Isn't it also conditional on the pattern, fixed pattern? Yeah. And the reason for that is are very small dimensions that are in here, 34 in the nanometer, uh, you know, is what's in production now. And so just charge coupling of nearest neighbors uh, can affect that. Are, are these errors uh, uniformly distributed, or are they likely to be off in one corner of the chip? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go through some uh, summary of this and kind of what are the characteristics that you have to deal with. Um, put this over here for a follow-up if anyone's interested. Uh, Neil Milky had uh, done a pretty good summary of, of this at uh, an IRPS paper was done this year for anyone that's interested. Uh, the graph on the uh, left over here shows the uh, number of cycles. And so this is the number of program and array cycles that are committed uh, to the device. The y-axis is just measuring this work at error rate. The different uh, curves on here are different manufacturers. IMFT just is the Intel Micron Flash Technologies joint manufacturing venture. It's just uh, they're all basically very similar type of characteristics. It's not to compare one to the other, but more or less to show what's the general trend, what are the physics uh, that's behind this. And you can see the kind of general characteristics on the left side is that, hey, you know, the raw bit error rate is a function of cycles. Uh, it's slightly different from each manufacturing, but generally goes up as the number of cycles. It's a power law as the number of cycles since it's a, uh, it's a log scale on the x-axis. Um, but let's look into some detail now. If you take a look at the ones that we measure as failure at a particular point in here, and I was just looking at the 5K cycle point, what failed in there, let's go look at what happens now on these devices. And what's really measuring on the x-axis here is kind of just uh, expanding out around that point, going from uh, 4K cycles out to 10K cycles. And what was measured of just a sampling basis of what the failures are versus what would happen if you measure on every single uh, cycle? Okay. Typically, uh, since in consumer electronics, um, usually manufacturers are selling components, individual components, and they're doing kind of statistical measures that are in there. Um, and in consumer electronics, if your USB key fails, okay, you'll typically get another. Uh, you won't be that upset about it. In your case of your compute data, hey, that's, that's my, you know, uh, like tax returns or uh, various other things, I really care what's going to happen on that. Um, and so it's really uh, important to know the precision of all these numbers. And if you look at this in here, what you find is that the sampling data is kind of, uh, uh, shows you something very different, is that uh, a particular cell in here had failed numerous times and then recovers. Okay? And the reason for that is because why? It's because you have these trapping effects that are transitory. Okay, traps are, are, are transient in nature. They have trap cross sections, and some of them have large cross sections, some of them have uh, uh, small cross sections, deep energy, shallow energy. And so some of these effects can be uh, erratic in time. And so understanding what the characteristics are of this is very critical in order to build kind of uh, the error handling system of your compute device. Uh, similarly on data retention uh, that's on there, uh, data retention, this is after uh, um, 10,000 cycles, just measuring what the raw bit error rate that, uh, that occurs. And so you have a time zero effect and then basically increasing as a function of time. Uh, this is under an accelerated uh, uh, test. 
And basically what you have is various detrapping effects, either just intrinsic detrapping of charge that was trapped in the oxide, or you can have hopping effects and what's called silk or stress-induced leakage currents of charge moving off of the uh, loading gate. There's also uh, uh, read effects. To read the device, you have to put a voltage on the top gate, which is now going to put a, a change the built-in field to the device and kind of change the error conditions. <clears throat> kind of put this all together, um, ECC now can change some of the effects that you have. If you have uh, this on here showing a couple of different conditions of what the uh, fractional sectors that are failing with one bit or on the right side is with uh, four bit uh, errors. Uh, yeah, ECC. And basically you can see two characteristics on here. Uh, one is that um, obviously on the right side the curve is shifted by a few orders of magnitude. That's the power of correction of ECC. Uh, the other thing is that what starts becoming dominant mechanisms now change. You can see that in the case of one bit errors that you were dominated by the number of writes and not dominated as, as much by what was happening in retention. Okay, the last two cases that were in there. When you have a four-bit error can, uh, case, that changes. And why is that? It's because it depends upon what the uh, population distribution is of the errors uh, that occur, what's going to dominate. Okay, so we kind of come up with uh, what's a, um, a term called Uber, which is the uncorrectable bit error rate. And it really has to come up with you know, it is typically defined as the number of errors that you have, fractional sectors that are failing, divided by the number of bits per sector and number of reads per sector. But it's not really just number of reads. It really has to take into consideration all these other things. It has to take into consideration uh, the number of cycles that you have, the number of reads per cycle because of the read disturb, uh, and then what's going to happen in the retention. So you build this uh, what is that error population under these different corner cases that can potentially exist. And once you go through that, you come up with a conclusion, well, you can uh, uh, have a very low uh, Uber rate. This is just doing an intrinsic calculation of what this is. Uh, the Uber rate is really just the slope of that curve. For this particular case here, it comes out to you know, uh, 3 to the minus 21, which is kind of ridiculously low. Uh, that's in there, but it's really just showing kind of the intrinsic capability. Uh, it really means that you're really going to be dominated by extrinsic characteristic, what is the uh, something well outside of the population, which usually you can uh, manufacturing and testing can do. So let me move this all now into uh, how do you deal with this in a compute architecture, and um, uh, what is the impact then on the compute system? What I'm going over is uh, what's inside of that uh, disk drive uh, that I showed you. Uh, it's basically a 10-channel uh, uh, device, and so there the an ASIC over here can speak to the SATA bus, uh, what's coming in from the compute side. Uh, we call that the, uh, the front end, and then the back end is what speaks, manages all the NAND. It's in there. It's 10 channels into the NAND. Uh, each NAND channel uh, can uh, have either uh, um, dual die because of a two die stacked together or four die stacked together so you have selectability of the chip selects that are in there. So you have a fair amount of concern, uh, concurrency in the back end. The host is issuing commands and then there's a wide concurrency into the back end to go fill <coughs> this. We manage each one of these channels with an ECC generator that can do all the parity checks and then if any correction is needed, pipes into this correction and then uh, arbitrates that data back out over there. You're not doing error correction across? Uh, this is a, this particular architecture is, uh, and the error rates, you can deal with it in one corrector as you kind of get more and more advanced technologies where the probability of failure per sector increases, uh, then you're, uh, you're going to have to have multiple uh, ECC well, engines. the errors in between blocks are more independent than within the block. Yeah, but it's the... Better to strike it over there. Uh, and those are kind of more advanced architectures, but for this particular case here, um, you know, the probability of error is so low that you can just deal with it. Okay. Using a hamming code or something of that ilk as opposed to a block code? Uh, these are all uh, uh, BCH codes. Uh, in, in disk drives, you tend to have uh, Reed-Solomon codes because of uh, burst errors, which really don't occur in here. 
Is that in fact an issue? Is the failure mechanism such that if one cell fails, the adjacent cells are no more likely to fail than the other cell, or is there a, a locality of failure kind of issue? Uh, if you have a locality of failure, it occurs on different pages. The uh, two cells that are uh, uh, physically next to each other are in logically different pages and logically oh, different sectors. Kind of that one. Yeah. yeah, so it's interleaved uh, in the actual NAN device itself. Well, it's not only important to have a controller that can deal with all this concurrency, you really have to go do a lot of algorithmic approaches uh, of uh, doing this, particularly in the case of small random writes, of how you're dealing with the fact that as the memory is organized into these large blocks, if you remember I was telling you that there can be 64 or 128 four kilobyte sectors, but this computer is not writing in that large chunk of data. It's writing in 512 byte sectors or 4K sectors at a time and wants to rewrite that data. How do we manage that? Well, there's a concept called write amplification, and I'll just walk through this conceptually in here. Uh, if you take a look at this is the case of uh, having 64 4K pages uh, in, in a physical block. Um, what happens if we wanted to have a small random write that was in there? Well, kind of the simplest way to deal with that is I have data to be written that was, uh, I'm updating these pages or these sectors within these blocks. Means I have to make a copy of what was everything else that was in that, um, uh, that uh, memory block. I'm going to have to write the new data, go insert that in there. I'm going to have to go erase the original block that was in there. And then rewrite the data. Okay? What happened? I have a, what we call a write amplification in this particular example was 32. Is that um, the, for every host request of writing a sector, I had to write 32 times as much data. Okay? What's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is, number one, is the reliability is a function of the number of writes. And now I've done 32 times more writes than I wanted to do, so I've stressed my reliability a lot more. And secondly, I have a controller now that's sitting and managing the NAND in the back end and is not paying attention to the host. Okay, and the host is king because that host request is what we were trying to, to service, right? This, we want the CPU having access to that memory as opposed to the controller having to deal with all this. So through algorithmic efficiency um, in this particular SSD, uh, what's shown here on the x-axis is just showing a uh, uh, runtime. Uh, the y-axis is showing the, uh, the data written. This is on this... Um, um, SSD that I showed you running some sort of uh, mobile workload on under XP. Uh, is there a question? It's a read, modify, erase, and the erase granularity of NAND is on a block size, which is the hundred and either sixty-four or one hundred and twenty-eight times the four K. So it wouldn't be bad if you're writing the whole, it wouldn't be as bad if you're writing the whole block. That's right, which is, which is why it works well in a consumer electronic application where you have, uh, you know, large blocks that are coming down, JPEG files, MP3, but when you're dealing with a compute system, that's not the case. For, for block, you, you know, if you're writing the whole block, you have to read the previous contest, right, you just write it out. That's right, as long as you have a pre-erased block. Okay. Oh, yeah, you need to erase you, you need to have a erase so what's shown here is, uh, and this is kind of tilted so you can see what's in the background here, otherwise it wouldn't be a very interesting graph. It's just showing what's the host writes in the front side and the back side is the NAND writes. In this particular example, uh, there was a, uh, a write amplification of only uh, 1.05. So for every host write, there was only 1.05 NAND writes. So almost a one-to-one -one efficiency in the algorithms of how you deal uh, with these, uh, what was a typical just compute application that's in there. Um, I have internal diagnostics that I can query my drive uh, that I have and so I can see what's on there. And I'm running actually about 1.02 uh, on my drive. So very efficient on the algorithms, which again is going to free it up to service the host and also make it available for uh, a good reliability. Good question? Yeah. This read merge write is happening in the operating system or out on the hardware? 
It's happening on the drive itself as managed by the controller. Okay. So the other one is, why are the erase blocks so big? Um, the erase blocks are big because if you try to make a small erase block, you have to electrically isolate each uh, one of the sectors from each other because of uh, sector because of disturb effects. You can't uh, the erase granularity will erase them all in parallel um, because uh, you have to put a voltage on the, on the silicon well, and then you'd have to separate that, which basically means it's equivalent cell size, which is cost per bit. Okay, so you can make that just a functionality of, of each individual cell, but you start going to much larger cell size, much larger cost, and now the value proposition starts going down because you're trying to, to find a, uh, an opportunity with inside of a compute system going after uh, hard disk drives, which uh, you know, sell for what? You know, an OEM probably pays 50 bucks for a hard disk and they get whatever capacity is available. And so there's, you can offer better performance and better capability, but it's at a certain price premium. The race block is currently 4K, you said? The right size is, is 4K, and then you have uh, anywhere from 64 to 128 pages per block. So what does that work out to about a uh, half a meg or so? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have to, that's something you have to go actively manage. And what's shown here is that you know, through efficient algorithms, you can do that. So can, can you tell me about what does it mean to be an efficient algorithm? Uh, no. No? No. Can't say. That's a, that's a secret sauce. The question that was, was that I can tell you, but that then the thing is story, you know, I have to shoot you, right? But, uh, so, so the, the question was, was that you try to do this behind the serial ATA interface. So you're telling the world of your hard disk and then you something different. That's right. It makes sense to at some point, you know, tell the operating system that I'm a device with a specific set of characteristics and do something different. So, for example, the same problem existed in uh, RAID systems when they were embedded, and people did log-based file systems so that they don't generate, you know, uh, um, to some and, you know, they eliminate the problem at the source or something okay. like that. So to some degree, I think you... To, do this as well? to some degree, I think that you will start seeing things like that evolve. There's uh, uh, already people who start looking at doing things of trying to serialize the data that gets written out so you don't have the small random writes. Things get written in a very serial fashion as kind of a... Uh, a utility uh, that sits between the OS and, and the disk. Um, one of the things that one has to be careful with is the advantage of, um, of having a very low cost memory is that it can evolve very, very quickly. Um, we produce a new NAND technology about every four to five quarters uh, that has to have a different spin of the ASIC to deal with its characteristics. Um, operating systems, unfortunately, don't spin at that rate. Um, and so you have to kind of have what are the uh, protocols that to interface to that that's going to be kind of uh, uh, stay in time, right, as opposed to be changing uh, very rapidly. And so there's a certain amount that will move up into the operating system, <coughs> a certain amount that should be dealt with in, uh, at the local level. Is there some sort of a cache then in this device that is non-volatile? that you're caching before you write? Uh, there's a DRAM in there, that's, uh, but it, it's not for a cache. It's just for uh, ba basically internal collection. But you're, cl and you're stating that based on actual measurements, mm -hmm. with a, whatever the block size coming from the host is, could be as small as 512 bytes, could be larger, mm -hmm. probably is larger, with a block size of a half a meg, mm -hmm. We're somehow bits. able to make a one-to-one -one write. Yes, sir. There's bits. Uh, okay. There's a half meg bits, though, so there's a factor of eight to go away before. I'm sorry, bits. Okay. Yeah. But half meg bits and 512k, 512 bytes. Okay. Not, but as, big a, not as big a gap. Yeah, it, it's about a thousand words. Yeah. One. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's still a number you have to deal with. It's still a big number. Yeah. But manageable. Not a huge number. Yeah. Uh, there's also variability in, in wear leveling, and so uh, you don't want to create a hotspot on, on, on the disk that if your LBA <coughs> range that you're writing to is fairly narrow, put all the writes in one space because <coughs> then what are you going to do? Wear out one section, then you have stale data that's been under a long data retention in another section. Uh, this is showing two different uh, approaches. <coughs> one is called a regioned wear leveling, where I'm just going to wear level the data within a region. Uh, the right side is showing uh, the capability that we put in place. 
uh, which is showing a 4% variation. <coughs> this uh, um, left side of the curve is really just where we're st uh, in the NAND. We have certain blocks that we store the firmware, bad block information that doesn't really get ever get updated. And so that's why you see the, uh, uh, the line on the left side. But over the, uh, the, uh, the drive capacity, the 4% variation. Yeah, there, there's a logical to physical mapping. But it's not done like in the file system, which can also consider the data. That's right. If you do that, you can also do some of the tricks to CD people do. Remember, erasing is hard. It's costly. So mm -hmm. You can avoid erasing of coding or management techniques. That's right. So you use those too? Yeah, you, you have to kind of, you don't want the erase to go in the foreground. Because people are going to You completely have multiple right but no erase the CD, the coding techniques. You can do that. It's a little difficult to cross the stripe that wide to do something like that. It's not necessarily striping. It's a coding trick. Yeah. Uh, so what are the kind of the reliability metrics? Uh, basically, I was showing you that you know intrinsically, you can end up with Ubers much less than 1 to the minus 15th, which is a typical, typical disk drive number. <coughs> uh, but it's really going to be a function of all, all this usage. Uh, so this particular one, this uh, multi-level cell, the one I showed you, uh, it's uh, 10 channels. Um, a typical number that people are looking at is uh, uh, what you and I do today is probably about three to five gigabytes a day. That's what a typical person does. Uh, what's kind of emerging is someone wants to see it, OEMs think of as a spec is about 20 gigabytes a day. Uh, this particular drive is an 80 gig drive, can do over 100 gigabytes a day and not wear out any of the reliability attributes, can do that for five years uh, continuously. On the SLC uh, version of that through these algorithms, you don't really think about gigabytes a day. Uh, for those applications, you think about IOPS. Uh, I'll go through the applications in a minute in, in here. Uh, this drive can sustain over 7,000 IOPS of uh, a typical number here. Like if you think about a enterprise workload is an 8K request, two to one read or write. It's kind of a typical number of an enterprise, even though it's hard to say what's typical in an enterprise usage. but. It, it's a good number to use. It can sustain over 7,000 IOPS for uh, for five years. So maybe I should already know this, but uh, after five years, what happens? It suddenly stops working, or you're down to uh, <laughs> 70 gigabytes instead of 80 gigabytes? Uh, what will tend to happen is you'll get uh, uh, back on those earlier curves. You'll see those exponential increases in, in the uh, bit error rates. And so you'll see the bit error rates start uh, increasing. It kind so of you pretty quickly go from usable to unusable. It's Basically, uh -huh. yeah. Are you adding and parity bits then? Pardon me? When the error rate goes up, do you add parity bits? No, it's a fixed, uh, uh, fixed, it's well, fixed you period time. Yeah, you can, you can do fancy things like that. Cost and performance, though. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, so is it going to detect when down. this error rate ramps up and, and move all my data off the disk for me? And yeah. Like yeah, there, there are kind of smart attributes and various other things to kind of deal with what happens in those circumstances. So, so the manner of failure is it? silently get smaller effectively as you're marking well, a, a bad or it a, a disk can't get smaller to well, the usable. to the, the user well, uh, this is a um, it's an 80 gigabyte decimal physically it's an 80 gigabyte binary so <laughs> <there's>, uh, <laughs> okay so that works that works out to about 7% spare capacity okay. uh, that's in there So why did random writes matter? Well, random writes uh, matter quite a bit because if you take a look in the case of, uh, of disk drives, very little is actually spent on the transfer time. Uh, most of it is spent trying to get to the data, doing the seek, the rotation. You spend the bulk of the data doing that. If you take a look at the, uh, uh, take a trace file off of you know, any one of the PCs or uh, any enterprise application, there's a lot of small random writes that are done in there. So you're spending a lot of time just finding the data. Okay? This is why if you take a look in the enterprise applications, uh, everyone is uh, short stroking uh, drives right? Mm -hmm. to try to get uh, spread the data over uh, a wider area that's in there, uh, get the, the fastest portion of that, uh, that stroke portion where you can get the uh, highest rotational uh, uh, rates that are in there. And so most of those requests are, are non-sequential. This is why we put the focus on what happens on the, on the random side. Uh, so this is showing uh, the capabilities that you have. This is uh, transfer size uh, in bytes on the x-axis. The y-axis is the uh, uh, 
right uh, IOPS for that transfer size with a Q depth of 32 for uh, each one of those. Um, it's showing basically uh, the, um, uh, the Intel drive, uh, the hard disk, and then just, you know, of course I have to show some competitors uh, to say how great we are. Uh, but basically, you know, uh, vast increase in the read capability. Clearly as you get out over here where you're just, you know, the seek time has gotten out of the picture and now it's just a serial throughput, those kind of uh, collapse down. But from a workload perspective, you're really dominating what's uh, going to be happening out over here. Uh, same thing on the, uh, on the right side. This is random uh, right IOPS. Uh, what happens, uh, why this curve bends back down and peaks at 4K <coughs> is because the page size is 4K, and if you're writing a 512 sector, you're writing a fraction of the, uh, of the page size. So that's why the IOPS uh, go down over there. But again, what you're seeing is uh, a great deal of capability of what's going to happen in these small random writes. When you write that 512, so the rest of it left empty then? Is uh, it a 512 byte block? Is it just uh, 4K? Different algorithms will do for different things. We basically concatenate the data together, different five, 12 bytes that will come together. So you do that in this drive? Yeah. So it doesn't waste the space. It doesn't waste the space. Um, what about power? Um, basically, it took a, uh, a power profile of a disk drive and uh, <laughs> uh, of a, uh, these, these are two different disk drives out here, uh, uh, 7200 and 5400 uh, RPM drives and solid state drive, and then just took the power profile in the x-axis is just a sorted um, version of that running a, a, a workload. And what you see in here is that the hard disk spends basically a very small percent of its time in the low power state, whereas the solid state disk drive spends uh, you know, the bulk of its time in a low power state. That basically means it's going to do its work, give it back to the processor, um, and uh, you know, can go down to a low power mode, saving battery life uh, on the device, uh, on your computer. Or, or, or you can just do more work uh, that's in there. Is this a power performance trade-off? Because it seemed on your first slide, or on the second, you had like you know, <coughs> your enterprise disk versus your consumer disk, and one had about 10 times, had a much greater uh, performance, but also about 10x the power. Or is it because, or is it because the design one was double layer? Um, I, I'm not sure uh, which slide we. The fast drive was 2.4 watts, and the other one was like 0.3 watts. Right, right. For the, the uh, SLC power. versus. Yeah, versus yeah. It's uh, uh, this particular power graph. I think was on the MLC. Um, yeah, this is on the MLC uh, uh, graph. The um, there's a slight difference power uh, between the two. Uh, because of uh, how, how the two are configured and just the amount of uh, throughput that's coming through them. But either one is substantially lower than what the hard disk comparison is. So yeah, this might be a slightly hard, you know, there might be a slight difference in there between the SLC and the MLC, but there's a great deal of difference between that and the hard disk. So um, this is one that kind of gets a lot of executives and Intel excited. Um, <laughs> Uh, what can a hard disk do for you? Uh, basically, this is showing here uh, two different processors, uh, you know, a two gigahertz processor and then a, the three gigahertz extreme version. And then uh, this is on a Sysmark uh, 07. It, and this is one of those benchmarks that are purposely skewed to get the IO system out of the picture. It's supposed to make the CPU be the center point of the benchmark. Sure. And even in this particular case in here, what you're seeing is that with the hard disk drive going to the next generation CPUs, you can get 25% scaling. So this is 25% you know, performance headroom. When you go to uh, the solid state disk drive, uh, not only do you get a pop on your existing device, but basically you get the headroom capability of what that next generation CPU was really able to, uh, to offer. If you compare it against a non-skewed benchmark, shouldn't the, this difference be larger? Compared, well, since the, the benchmark was geared towards yes, the processor, yes, 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 yeah, I understand. It yeah, yeah, I understand. Drive. Yeah. So if you don't do this skewing, it could look even better. Yeah, there, there are benchmarks that uh, uh, various folks that are working on to try to 
But um, you didn't you didn't compare it against other be benchmarks yet for this particular. No, for this one, it, it would be more dramatic. There are, are ones that are kind of more of responsiveness benchmarks that are really just starting to come out that uh, that show even a greater response. So let me talk about solid state disk and. Uh, in data centers, um, and uh, this is kind of you know, uh, it, it's a lower cost, greener, more reliable. This is something that <coughs> data center it has immediate return on investment uh, for doing. Uh, this is showing in here, uh, same graph on the left that I showed you earlier. Uh, this is showing an example here of a TPCC report, uh, and one of the interesting things is you look at this here. And this is a typical report that's done on a data center to say, hey, what's the benchmark capability of that, uh, of that particular system that's configured? This system here is configured with over 7,015 uh, K RPM drives, okay? Uh, that's a lot of power, a lot of space, a lot of dollars going into that. So, you yeah, know. But it's not a lot of disk space, though. Those are <coughs> 36 gigabyte drives. That's right, but there's 7,000 of them because they're, they're spreading the data very wide. Yes, but this is a very strange application because... It's just an example. Right. Just an example, okay? It's a benchmark. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's a benchmark. Nobody would build this. Yeah. It, it's a benchmark system. Okay. <laughs> it, it's not unusual to have uh, systems that have several thousand disk drives on them. That's not an unusual thing. That's the important thing. Yeah, that, that, that's what, not unusual. Okay? Realistically, somebody's going to be continuously replacing these, these actual drives. Is how splash that you know your replacement rate per day if you're getting up here to have a, 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 an installation meaning thousands of disk drives? Or well, let me, let me, you let me don't trade. replace them. You just okay. buy too many. So here, here's something we actually did in one of our Intel labs. Uh, this was a um, a system that we had. It has 490 fiber channel 15k drives uh, that are uh, uh, configured in four racks, and uh, we replaced it with what you see up top. Okay, these were eight SSDs uh, that were uh, configured in there. Okay, it, it was not a product; it was basically a prototype approach that we were doing. Um, let's compare these two configurations now. We actually built this and ran it. Um, what you have is basically uh, a system, by the way, that delivered twice the IOPS uh, on the system with the SSD compared to the to the hard drive. The storage cost actually got, went down by eight x. Uh, the floor space by 24x mm -hmm. energy cost uh, uh, over time because not only are you producing that heat, you have to take that heat out of that data center. It uh, goes down by a dramatic amount. Uh, so you have the energy savings in there. And by the way, you do have <coughs> that, uh, 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 the IOP improvement. And in terms of replacement rate, what I was showing you earlier, basically you can sustain those IOPs for five years. Uh, so you know if you can want to compare the replacement rate of so a few hundred drives <coughs> that are failing, they're going to fail at a, just a, a higher rate. As a matter of fact, and how much did the capacity go down? Yeah, yeah the, the usable capacity is about the same. That's because those are tiny drives. Yeah. Most uh, if you take a look at a lot of these systems, they're they're they striped across. How about initial <laughs> cash outlay? Um, uh, Florida ninety. <laughs> well, you're replacing uh, four hundred drives with uh, four hundred eighty drives. No, they, just uh, initial uh, cost. Five hundred drives. Um, I actually don't know that specific number because okay. this was a prototype system. That was in there. And what you're seeing kind of in, that people are looking at it in the data centers is, uh, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not looking. Uh, Sorry, uh, would you mind telling us what the capacity of the HDDs and the SSDs were in these two? Uh, I don't know the HDDs in there, and the uh, uh, the SSDs were uh, 32 gigabytes. 32 gigabytes. Okay. I, I don't know what the hard disk was. Did these guess what the HDD was? <laughs> uh, I, I actually don't know. One hard drive. Like, Okay. But, but you're striping that data across many drives. And, and the important thing in here, I'm not trying to say that a solid state disk is going to replace every disk drive in the data center. But let, let, me, let, me, let me finish. I'm not trying to, to imply that. What I'm trying to imply in here is that you can really reduce the amount of disk drives, improve the performance. And what you're seeing is a lot of people are looking at kind of how solid state can come into a tier zero type application. Okay. It's not going to replace what the disk drives are, but how do you then use them for the performance in the tier zero and then use in kind of a tier one is where the hard disks are going to be placed. It's kind of more of a balanced system approach. There was a recent article published like two days ago which implied that maybe 5% of the high performance drives are short stroked in the total market. 
you're, you're seeing to imply there's a lot more short stroked high performance drives. Do you have any statistics? Um, I'm not the expert in that, so I don't know. Okay, there is, I mean, I literally saw it yesterday and the day before, uh, yeah, implying it it's a 5% five five of the market. Yeah, but if he got 5% of this market, he'd be real happy. So 5% <laughs> <laughs> of the high performance market. So it's 5% of 20%. It's about 1%. Question? So would I be correct in estimating that your SDD array has about 1 60th of the capacity of your HDD array here? Um, I actually don't want to quote a number because I don't know. Um, you, know you can say what, what's the typical capacity of a 15K well, RPM. Well, you said the are about the same capacity. Yeah. 500 on one yeah. side and 8 on the other. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. As what I said, I think a lot of people are looking at how to use a solid state solution now in a tier zero type application to basically get that performance and then use the capacity of the hard disk in kind of a tier one configuration. It's not meant to say, hey, replace it outright. Um, I've been at this for 20 years and trying to do this, and that would be a, I, I know that was a, a foolish approach 20 years ago. But it's, it's not actually that terrible. Like if you multiply that by 60, it's actually only twice as big. I mean, you can replace it. It's not, it, it's not a win, but it's, it's in the same ballpark. Okay. Yeah, but your hotspot's not going to be your entire data. Set. It's going to be 2%, which is what he's at. That's so right. That's fine. Well, but but we've, we've trained people to do no seeks. Um, you know, Yahoo, you get one seek a day when you go sequential through the whole drive. Um, <laughs> so <there's, laughs> so we, we train people to run, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with no seeks and to, to use the use disks the way they're, they can be used, which is never seek, stream, stream all the time, stream off of different spindles. Mm -hmm. And there we're, you know, we're going for the whole, the capacity matters. And you know, it's not as seek dominated as numbers you've got. Well, if you want to keep up, you, you can't see. That's Never right. see. That's right. And we train people to write code that way. Train people about around a you know, yes. particular solution. Um, we got I want show, 10 minutes. Yeah, I want to just show a few quick slides here of kind of a, uh, a different solution, which is a uh, uh, what we call a NAND cache. The marketing term for it is uh, turbo memory. And basically, this is uh, you know, um, I, I have a solid state disk in here, right? Because I get one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most people are not going to go spend you the money. Sample. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you got some money? <laughs> <laughs> most people. <Sample. laughs> most people are not going to be spending the money to get the performance of the solid state drive. Uh, you know, at least not in the first generations of it, um, or even in your home. You're going to have large video files, the types of things that are not going to need that performance. Okay? And so there's a, a concept out here of using uh, uh, a NAND cache, basically, uh, on the PC so you can get the performance experience of what the solid state can bring, but basically at a fraction of the cost of what the disk drive is. And you use the disk out here for really the volume of data. This is where your videos are going to be, your home movies, uh, various other things, but from a performance perspective, can you use the NAND as basically uh, a non-volatile caching? So it's another layer of the memory hierarchy uh, that's in there. The first generation was something called uh, Robson uh, that we introduced, uh, uh, I believe, last year. Um, this was something that basically um, sits out on the PCIe uh, 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 bus. Kind of going, uh, what that looks like is kind of the standardized <coughs> approaches on this. There's uh, uh, looking out from the uh, host uh, out, you have the uh, non volatile memory host controller interface, so it knows how to speak the software protocol out to basically a flash controller. That flash controller then speaks over standardized bus. ONFI is an open NAND flash interface uh, that basically speaks over standard protocol to NAND. It's, uh, NAND is one of the last commodity memories that actually uh, has standard interface and protocols uh, to, uh, <laughs> to, to be able to speak to it. <laughs> and so basically, this is kind of trying to get a high-speed standardized interface so that you can basically build a module 
and then putting caching algorithms in there so that you can decide what's going to be going to this cache, uh, what do I want there, what do I want going out then uh, to the disk drive, uh, applications where you can have user pinning, so basically pinning applications so that they stay in the cache as opposed to being paged out to the disk uh, so you can get that performance capability. Again, at a fraction of the cost, but it's because you're dealing with a much lower capacity now. Um, eventually, this moves into just putting it directly down into the platform because uh, as that becomes more ubiquitous uh, in, in the platform, you start moving a lot of the controller into the uh, chip cell itself uh, to do the control algorithms. And then basically having more of a basic module out over there uh, to uh, a standardized <coughs> interface. But this basic module doesn't know how to speak PCI, so kind of what, what do you do? You kind of uh, have a, a NAND only, uh, uh, you have a, a, a connector that basically is going to be leveraging all the DRAM standards so they can fit into a DRAM socket uh, for that. And then it knows how to speak that protocol because the controller will be on the chipset that can speak to that, uh, that interface. And again, it's an opportunity that you can get a lot of the experience of what the solid state disk drive gives you, but then at a fraction of what the cost is because it's going to be a smaller capacity system. And you still have the volume then for, uh, of the disk drive for what you're doing for all these other files. So where are we headed with NAND in the future? Question. Um, How much advantage of having, do you get by having it separate instead of just stuffing the NAND into the, behind the disk drive interface and just in that, in that package and then there's no system architecture change Microsoft doesn't have to do anything for you. Your disk drive just faster. Well, people tried to do that a few years ago with hybrid drives, right? Yeah. Uh, didn't really very go, uh, go very far. Um, I'm not sure if there's going to be another effort at that or not. Uh, you're kind of, uh, this can be much higher performance capability because you're not limited by just that uh, disk <coughs> interface uh, that's out there. And so you can probably um, uh, make that work. But, that, I mean, there, but it was it was yeah, tried. It was tried. I'm not an expert yeah, on why yeah, that yeah, why I, that I failed, know, but yeah, it, it did go away. But there's no secret latency. There's no rotational latency. There's just the interface cost. Mm -hmm. So are you, so it was it that the interface is a lot faster, or yeah, they they had all the information that that you got, and yet they failed. Mm -hmm. So good for me. <laughs> no, it means that you lost three years of sales. That's bad for you. Job security. Well, these days that's important. You're plugging this thing into the DRAM bus, mm. but you're not treating it as, as memory, are you? You're basically it. No, you can't. Functions you, and sending and receiving blocks. My, 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 my CPU friends keep on uh, telling me that I'm not a memory guy. I, I'm I/O. I'm storage. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, because they're not going to deal with me through, uh, uh, they have to bring software in to go deal with the latency of NAND, which is around 25 microseconds access time uh, for reads, and then you have to put software on top of that. You have to contact switch anytime you go out of this thing. So why aren't we just better off putting our costs into a bigger DRAM cache in a personal computing application? Uh, I have this extra hierarchy. What is, I mean, a bigger DRAM cache should do do it better and for less price, except for the non-volatility. And the you know, PGD D is pretty good. You can go to DRAMExchange.com and look at the difference in price of a DRAM versus uh, sure. versus uh, flash. It's uh, you know, at least two? no, it's 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 much more than that. Uh, and so it, it's several to one uh, to begin with. Uh, with uh, uh, various pinning applications, instant on. My, my system is effectively an instant on uh, system uh, because you know uh, it, it doesn't have to load what's in the DRAM uh, capability. Well, isn't the real driver here, at least for laptop-like applications, the reliability? Uh, typical laptop uh, disks die. Um, Roughly every six months, <laughs> yes. and uh, recovering <laughs> recovering the data that you didn't back up on that laptop costs order three thousand dollars, and isn't always possible. Yeah, we we did a study through the I, IT organization. Someone's going to probably produce a white paper on this of just uh, you know uh, Intel's got you know how many tens of thousands of laptops and its employee base, and what rate of 
mm -hmm. failures do we get on, on disk drives? It's extremely high. Yeah. My travel computer is a, has a four gig flash drive. And Good works man. Just fine. And runs Linux. So let me, let me, uh, <laughs> so let me, let me finish this up real quickly. We're so, so where are we headed? Is a 32 uh, gig. Uh, basically, there's a um, roadmap of technologies out in the future, whether it's uh, traditional floating gate storage, uh, floating trap, three and various 3D approaches. A lot of which I think uh, uh, various departments at Stanford here are working on, on there. And so I think there's kind of a healthy pipeline of technologies on the future that uh, I can finally say, I think we're about to start. <laughs> so thank you. We probably can take a couple questions. We're For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.